going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 7. As we read 2 Kings chapter 7, I want to be, uh, we're, we're going to read a, a bit, but uh, I was going to read 20 something verses, but I'm going to kind of just kind of read a few and then I'll give you the gist of the summary of what's actually taking place and what's going on. The Lord just dropped this message in my heart this week because we have some people I think that really need to hear this to know some things. You know, we're in some delicate times right now. We're in the best of times. Don't look at how, how, because I, I, I was one that would always be pessimistic in my approach when it came to society. Now, when it comes to the things of God, I'm always optimistic. But when it came to society, or when it comes to society, when I see uh, right before my eyes from the time of when I was a little child growing up, you know, I grew up in the born in the 60s and grew up in the 60s and 70s and my teenage years and so forth, high school and all this. And I've just seen before my very eyes a dramatic change from one extreme to the next. Many of y'all who've been born in the 60s or 50s and maybe early 70s, you, you can identify with what I'm talking about. You know, I've seen so many things just right before my eyes take place and most people are like, they just go with the flow. And it's like, I'm like, no, this is just crazy. This is wrong. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Only to find out it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But if, yeah. instead of us getting worse, what we need to do is we need to change our approach. Or shall I say, I need to change my approach. And not look at things in such a dogmatic, uh, pessimistic way. But to look at what God is doing in the midst of a change. Yeah. That's why these times we're living in are trying times. But these are going to be some times we're going to see visually. The hand of God move in ways we've never even imagined or dreamed about. But it's going to involve everybody. Everybody's going to have to be on deck. All hands are going to have to be on deck. Listen, you may say, I don't have a ministry. The devil is a liar. God didn't call you to sit there and twiddle your thumbs. But we've got places to go, people to see, places to be, to be a blessing on our way somewhere get ready to happen. Amen? So we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 7. I want to read, start, start at verse number 1. But before I actually read verse 1, let me kind of build up uh, a, a, a little bit of what's about to happen. In chapter 6, we see where Elisha, who is the successor of Elijah the prophet. This is Elisha, the one that received the double uh, portion blessing. Now he's continu continuing on in the prophetic ministry. He has a servant by the name of Gehazi, and there are different kings that have come against Israel. All of these different kings have encamped around the mountains of Israel, getting ready for attack. And, and before attack was imminent, uh, Elisha was sitting there in the house, just relaxing on his easy chair, taking a little nap somewhat. And his uh, you know, servant went outside to check on some things, and as he looked up, he saw all of these mountains and chariots of different kings and armies that had come against Israel and they came against the man of God because it was told to them that everything that Israel does, uh, everything the kings plan, Israel has a prophet that hears from God and that tells them in advance where to go and what moves to make. And as a result, the kings got teed off so they came together and they said, we're going to all capture this guy. They came there to take care of business and to take Elisha out. And when his servant went outside, I don't know what he was doing outside. Maybe he was checking the mail. I don't know. <laughs> but whatever happened during that time, he looked outside and went, whoa! And he ran back inside and said, oh my God, Elisha, you got to see this. All of the kings and armies have come against us. Oh, there's going to be mass murder here. They, they, they're coming for you. And Elisha just rests in the word of God with confidence and full assurance of knowing that God is on his side. Amen? Amen? He says, that's okay. He looked outside and looked up over the mountains and he started looking around and went and took a visual all around, a panoramic view of everything. He says, no worries, no worries at all. Don't worry about it at all. They that are with us are greater than they that are with them. And when he said that the servant couldn't understand, he said, Father, just this one time, please open his eyes. Let him see what most people see in the natural. Let him see in the supernatural the things most people don't even see. Just as real as this natural realm is, there exists a supernatural realm. You've got to believe when I say this. Even though you live in your life in a natural realm, everything is 
three dimensional, but in the supernatural realm, there's so many different dimensions. Demons exist in the supernatural realm. Angels exist in the supernatural realm. The supernatural realm is more real than this natural realm is. We're literally, literally tied down to certain degrees of the natural realm, but that's why when we get to heaven, in order to withstand all of the greatness of heaven, we're going to have to have a new body. You can't even exist. The Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to have, we're going to, have to have a brand new body in order to be able to take or withstand the miracle blessings and the great dimensions of things that await us in heaven. Amen? Amen. So when God opened his eyes, he went, whoa, whoa. And he looked and he saw the whole mountain and the whole scope of everything. He saw chariots of flames of fire from heaven. And he went, oh. They that are with us are greater than they that are with them. And he could rest assured, his servant could rest, because he saw that God was greater than that of the enemy. Amen? Amen. Now, having said that, the Bible says that the, uh, 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 the Samaritans were, during that particular time, they were stricken with a famine. And, 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 and Elisha prayed that they would be blind. Right after the service eyes were open, he prayed blindness would come on all of those armies. And they were blind, and he had to lead them to the Samaritan camp. Yep. And when he did, their eyes became open, yep. you know, after he prayed a second time. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says a huge famine took place, and it was a terrible famine. Crops had stopped growing, the ground had dried up, nobody could eat. It was so terribly bad that people had to kill their own newborn babies. Put them in boiling pots and boil them and eat their babies just to sustain life. And there was one incident where there were two ladies and they were trying to decide whose babies, both of them were mothers and they both had children. And they, they, they came down to where all they had to eat were their children. So one of them said, well, we'll eat one of the babies today and then tomorrow we'll eat the other. So then you know, they were trying to decide which baby to do so that, you know, the, the lot fell on one of these ladies. And she turned around and they boiled the baby and they ate the baby. The next day, they ran out of food, so they were going to boil the other lady's baby, but the other lady went and hid her baby. Mama. And so the, they saw the king of Israel standing on the wall, and he was looking down at the situation, and they said, the lady said, king, come here, we got a situation. This lady is a liar. My child was born alive yesterday. We had to eat him, and she was to boil her baby today, and she hid her baby. And the king, the Bible says, he heard this thing, and he was like, Oh my God, it's come down and eat babies? And the Bible says he rent, he tore his robe, and he walked away and he cursed God. And he said, the God of Elisha, I'm going to have that prophet's head for all of this stuff that has withstood against us. He said, I'm going to have his head. So the king came with his servant. He sent a servant ahead of himself. And the servant comes to go to the door of Elisha the prophet, getting ready to behead him. But Elisha, being that he's a seer, sees this thing happening before it happens. So he tells the people with him, he says, now, there's a guy coming to, to, to gather together, you know, his strength to take my head off. And he says, don't be dismayed when you see him because the king is right behind him. He said, but that's okay. God's got this whole ordeal under control. Amen. So sure enough, the guy knocks on the door. He opens the door. The king's right there behind him. And this is where it begins in verse 1 of chapter 7. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. This is what he's telling the servant of the king as well as the king. It says, thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time a measure of fine flour will sell for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now you got to understand. These are terms that we're not used to, shekels and all of these different measurements and weights and so forth. But just imagine this, because of the famine, what normally would cost about $2 is now $50. It was extortion. It was way too much for anybody to be able to afford. That's why people were starving. Nobody had the money to do it. Nobody had the kind of money. It was crazy. But he says, tomorrow, what's costing you 50 bucks? tomorrow this time is going to be $2. That just gives you how much of a drop. It might not be 100% accurate, but it gives you how much of a drop as to what is God, God has up his sleeve for the very next day. Okay, now listen to this. When he says that, the Bible says in verse 2, the captain on whose hand the king leaned on answered the man of God and said, 
if the Lord should, should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Now, don't think that he's just asking the question. I mean, is it really possible? No, he's not asking the question. He's been very arrogant. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a, a direct uh, rebuke against God. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, listen, you free prophet, you and your God. This, I don't care if God opened the windows of heaven. It can't be, not even with God. Sort of like what these guys said during the time when the Titanic was built. And remember, they were so beside themselves and so arrogant that they said that this ship is unsinkable. No one could ship the, uh, sink the ship, not even God, are the, are the words that they said. And lo and behold, in 1917, I believe it was, the Titanic was sank. Yeah. Amen. And it probably was because of that statement. Wow. Not even God can sink this ship. And it's still at the bottom of the ocean today. In fact, recently the whole world came to a screeching halt at attention when the submarine went down there trying to discover the Titanic. Titanic, and they had different uh, uh, tours that people would have to pay two hundred and fifty thousand yep. dollars to go into a submarine just to tour the Titanic underwater. Yep. And you know the story; those, those, those. Uh, I think it was nine people or seven or six, however many was they. The thing imploded, and all of those. People lost their lives in that submarine because of the pressure and so forth. Now that particular submarine had some faults in it and a whole, whole lot of stuff. It wasn't certified properly and all of this. But those guys lost their lives recently trying to uh, go on a tour of the Titanic, Titanic underneath the ocean. So, so that's what took place. So this guy said it in arrogance. He said it in arrogance. It's not going to happen. It's just no way. So now we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit. Now. The Bible tells us right during that time that there were four lepers, four leprous men. Now let me say something before I go any further reading this. Leprosy during the time of the biblical days in the Old Testament and even during the time of Christ was a very highly contagious airborne disease. It was a flesh-eating bacteria type disease that would mess with the nervous system and then it would sometimes eat flesh away fingers sometimes would be missing. If it's on your face, you can see the bone underneath your skin where it would eat through or the nose would be exposed and they would have to put some kind of cloth over their faces or whatever. It was airborne. Very highly contagious disease. So much so that people who were leopards were treated as the scum of the earth. You would get as far away from a leopard person as possible or else you could contract that particular disease. They had a rule that if you had leprosy, you had to announce ahead of time, wherever you were, unclean, unclean. So people would scatter, get, gather their belongings and get away from you as far as they could. You couldn't be in lines. You couldn't be in fellowship with people. You couldn't talk. You were ostracized. You were treated as somebody that was the scum of the earth. And it was something you couldn't even help. That's how people would treat a person that was leprous. And not only that, but the leper people, the people that were lepers, they, 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 of course, had to wither away to nothing because you couldn't hold a job and work among other people. Right. Nobody would hire you. Right. Where you how are you going to get paid? So you would end up, without a doubt, destitute and homeless, being a leper. And so what they did is at least they had a little bit of compassion and they got together colonies or, if you will, uh, different camps that they would put all of the leper people in together. So at least they could have a commonality or a fellowship with each other, even in that dire situation. So they were called, they were called leper colonies or leper camps for all of the people that had leprosy to be there to basically have each other because it was a very disheartening disease. Now, during this time of this great famine, during this time of this, of this great, great famine in the land of Samaria, there were these four men that were four lepers and they were walking together. Now, of course, they're not afraid of each other because they all got the disease and they're literally all dying. They're withering away and, and their lives are just being, you know, just going by every day. And it says in verse 3, now four men who were lepers were at the entrance of the city's gates. And they said one to another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city. And we shall die there. If we say we will sit still here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to 
to the army of the Syrians. If they spare us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, well, we shall but die. We're going to die anyway. Okay? So they arose in the twilight at midnight when nobody was around. Most people sleep. They arose. They went into the Syrian camp. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no man was there. No man was there. So you got a scenario. There are four lepers. They're dying. They're sitting around wondering what is there to do? What is there to do? Where, where is there to go? All of a sudden they're hungry. They're broke. They're ostracized. They're alone. They only have each other. They're all dying. They don't know what time, but each somebody will be probably closer to death than the next one. Who knows? So they're sitting at the entrance of this camp full of army. Uh, 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 you know, artillery and people and soldiers, the whole nine. And then they're, they're trying to figure out what is there to do now. If we sit here, we're going to die because we're all dying as it is. If we go into the camp, the worst thing that can take place is they capture us. They kill us. Well, we'll just be put to death quicker because we're dying anyway. But what, why don't we just take our chances and maybe if they spare our lives and keep us alive, at least we'll have some food we could possibly eat to sustain us for however many days or weeks we may still have. So why don't we, instead of twiddling our thumbs, doing nothing, let's make at least a few weeks or however many days we have left count. Let's make those days count. Let's not wither away doing nothing. If we're going to go out, which we are, we're going to go out with a fight. Right. Let's go out with a pain. Let's go out doing something positive. Instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, let's try to do something. Yes, right. So the reason no one was there was because God supernaturally caused the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots in great number. So they vanished in fear, thinking Israel had hired the Egyptians to help them fight. And the Syrians left their houses, horses, donkeys, everything. The four lepers were eagerly pocketing the silver, the gold, and other spoils. And there was a, multi uh, a multiple buffets of different foods left in almost every single tent. So the lepers began to fill their faces with food. I mean, think about it. They were stuffing themselves, eating food like there was no tomorrow. I mean, they were tearing up slapjack biscuits, bobo eggs, frangatang bacon, suicide grits, greaser slab, or cricket crack. Man, they had some home cooking. They were tearing that food up. You're not going to be able to taste of it. 
And sure enough, that very prophecy took place the very next day. He saw it. He was the one that let the people in, but the trample, the, 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 the crowd of people came in and trampled over him, and he lost his life that very day. Now, how many know that these lepers, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to them, but you know they still died, right? But at least they went out full instead of starving, and they went out with a little more joy and peace and being totally fulfilled with their newfound wealth and spoils. And they helped the entire nation of Israel. I would say, without a doubt, that these four lepers, if they can be remembered by anything, they left a mark in the earth. Amen. As a result of their faith and their sacrifice, they, my friend, left a mark in the earth. And Israel, the prophecy came to pass where they no longer had to starve because of what these guys had discovered. Amen. Amen. The title of this message this morning is simply this. Don't just sit there and die. Get up and live. Look at your neighbor and just say, neighbor, don't just sit there and die. Get up and live. Now I want you to say it for real this time. Say it to somebody behind you. Look, look at the person behind you. See, see now you talking to the back of the head. <laughs> Say, hey, hey, I'm talking to. <laughs> Don't just sit there and die. Don't just sit there and die. But get up and live. Yeah. Let's give the Lord a praise, somebody. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, I would like to use my imagination. And this is not in scripture. This is just your pastor going on a tangent, a wild tangent. Okay. We've got four different prophets. Not prophets, but four different leprous men. And I would like to say each one of them had a different personality for the sake of ministry. This is not in the Bible. This is me taking a little leap of my own little uh, imagination going on a side note. This is not biblically recorded. This is just me doing it, of course. I would like to call the first one a pessimist. I want to call the second leper a nihilist. The third one I like to call a realist. And the last one I want to call him the optimist. Okay. Now, the Bible doesn't label any of these. I'm just doing this for the sake of ministry. Now, let's say we got four different opinionated guys dying here. Now, the Bible didn't say that, but they're all dying. We know that. They all are lepers. And a pessimist is a person that every time he's around or she's around, they are always speaking negative. Oh, yeah. Nothing. They can never see the good out of anything. Yeah. Everything is negative. You ever met anybody like that? Yeah. That's, all, that's called a pessimist. They, they will break a person's hope. They'll break your joy. You don't want to hang around that kind of person. If you got a friend like a, a pessimist, then you are in bad shape. Yeah, okay. You really are at the end of your ropes. If those are the kind of friends you hang around. Because these are the kind of people that brings the party completely down. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they shake everything up the wrong way. Nobody likes a negative person. Oh, what time does it start? It starts at 7 o'clock. They say it's supposed to rain around that time, probably about 6.30 or 7. It's supposed to be raining clouds and fans getting all dark. You probably ain't going to have that many people show up because, you know, it's going to rain. Well, no, we're still going to plan it. I'm just telling you, you know, most people don't come out in the rain. You don't want to hear all that. No, no. Never forget the time we went to, uh, uh, what is that place? Uh, Haiti. Yeah. Back in 2010 when the earthquake took place, we sent a team of of missions, of missions, we went over there to minister to Haiti, and we had a guy, everything that came out of his mouth yeah. was negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And being in charge of the group, I'm trying to be the strong, but I wanted to get in the flesh and say, boy, I want to get back on a plane and go back to America. I know that's right. Because everywhere we went, they were saying, man, he, he said, it's going to rain, and the clouds, and this and that. I said, that's okay, we're going to preach in the rain. Well, if you preach in the rain, you can get electrocuted. The odds of getting electrocuted are higher and greater because of the rain and the thunder and the lightning. I said, man, where did this guy come from? I thought we screened these folk before we took them on mission trips. How did he get past the crowds? He was so negative, it was un unreal. I said, look, I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. I said it in front of everybody. I know it came across harsh, but I couldn't take any more. When I did, he shut up and dropped his head. I said, listen, man, I'm not trying to be hard with you. I said, but don't come bringing that negative energy around us. I said, we're men and women of faith. God sent us here to take care of business. Amen. He's going to move ahead of us. God's got a plan we don't know nothing about. Amen. I don't even know anything about, but 
I got faith to know it's going to be well. Yeah. And sure enough, when we got there, they had a big, giant tent. Yeah. That thing was huge. Yeah. You could see three or 4,000 people. It was so big. Wow. And it came down raining hard, but guess what? Nobody inside got affected because we were under a tent. Amen. You see how God had it worked out? So that's what negative, pessimistic people do in life, is speak negativity. They can never go forward in the things of God. If you're a pessimistic person, I pray you change today your perspective, because don't ever think God's going to move. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that cometh unto God must believe that he is. That he's a rewarder of them that what? Yeah. Diligently seek him. Yeah. Then you have this guy called the nihilist. What is a nihilist? A nihilist is a person that really is an unbeliever. They don't believe in God or anything. They don't believe in hardly anything. In fact, life is meaningless. There's no purpose in life. We're just here. We're just here. They nihilists will come up with some crazy stuff like, you see this pulpit? You see it? You see it? It's not even really there. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's there. It feels like it's there, but it's really not there. Because think of it. They, they, they say, you see how this car is parked here? If I come and hit it, it'll be hit. But guess what? If the cars move, it was just there. Now, if I hit that space, I won't hit anything because it's no longer there. Well, that's how you, they, they come up with this weird theology that's really demonic and crazy. It would be it takes more faith to believe to be a nihilist than it would be to believe in a God that you cannot see, <laughs> to be honest. So I, my hand is tipped off because they got faith in a negative sense, but it certainly doesn't please God. Then you have what we call a realist. Now, a realist is a person who accepts the situation as it is and is prepared to deal with it accordingly. Uh, you know, basically, they... Just deal with it. Hey, it is what it is. You, you've heard that phrase before. It is what it is. Yeah. We just got to deal with it. I don't know how it's going to work out, but we're just going to have to deal with it. At least they got enough gumption to not just sit there and do nothing. Amen. But now, the one I love is the optimist. Yeah. The optimist can take the raggediest, most doomed-looking situation and look at it, examine it, and say, that ain't nothing to God. God's going to give us a blessing out of this. A miracle's going to take place. He's going to turn it around. Don't ask me how. I just know one thing. I got a piece about it on the inside. I don't see how it's going to happen. But I know one thing. God ain't going to let me down. He never has and he never will. He sent us here. We're not here for nothing. We're here for a purpose. God's going to be the one to uproot, make the crooked way straight, make wilderness out of the desert. God's going to be the one that overturns this situation. God's going to be the one that make mountains, molehills, that make crooked people straight. Heal broken bodies. The same law, so God's gonna do it. We don't know how, but we know He's gonna do it. How many believe God's gonna do it? That is the attitude to have, the optimistic attitude. That should be the attitude of the Christian. And yes, there are problems, yes, there are headaches. I don't even want to bore you with just this week's problems. Oh God, my wife said, don't go there. <laughs> Man, one after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next came on us just this week. Oh yeah. Amen. Oh yeah. I said, Sunday, you preached a message called Praise, the Street to God's Address. Yeah. I said, you're gonna have to do what you told them to do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This week wasn't the time to praise God. This week was the time. Let them old cuss words that died with the old man before you got saved. <laughs> this is the time to resurrect them cuss words. <laughs> bring them back to life and just bring them out. God, bring them. What the what? Yeah. This is the week to do that. But God says, you preached it to them. You told them they're going to be tested. You're being tested. You do what you told them to do. My wife is my witness. I said, Lord, I will bless the Lord. At all times. His praises are going to continue to be in my mouth. And I started blessing the Lord. And I didn't feel good when I did it. Because I'm in the flesh. But I told you when you praise God. Praise is the bridge that gets you from the flesh into the spirit realm. And before you knew it, God turned the whole ugly situation around. By the end of one of them days last week. My wife and I were praise God. Oh, <laughs> 
you got to have a right attitude. And it worked. It worked. I told you it would work. I had all that pressure on me. I did it, and it worked. God turned it around. That's why I gave you the report. I said, everything came together. I said, somebody must have been praying. It sure didn't start out that way. But it ended up that way because praise was instituted. Woo! I feel like talking about praise now. Let me keep on going on. So these four lepers made the best of, of their lives, even in their death, at the end of their ropes, they changed the fate of an entire nation by being bold, daring, and going for broke, even if it meant their lives. They shared their newfound wealth with the entire nation of Israel. I want you to listen to this really clearly and really good. Listen. Your greatest success in life oftentimes comes right after your greatest failure or disappointments in life. Amen. Amen. Let me say that again. Your greatest success in life oftentimes comes right after your greatest failure or your greatest disappointments yeah. yes. in life. Yes. That's why if something tears apart or run, runs down or runs ragged and doesn't look like it's going to work out, don't count the end. It's not over. It's not the end. It's not yet. God never ends it on a negative. He never ends it on a negative. He never, never, never ends it on a negative. If it's negative, it's because it's not over with yet. But you don't understand. No, you don't understand. He's not going to end it on a negative. Well, you don't understand. So-and-so died. They died. How is it not a negative? Who said death was a negative? Didn't the Bible say we passed from death unto life? On their end, it's a positive. Yeah. They just got transferred and promoted from this raggedy life to a new body, a new heaven. So it's not negative to them, but to you it's negative. Because you're going to miss them from this side. But God will give you the grace and the peace to be able to go through it even amid the storm. And in time, you'll be okay. You will be okay, but never listen. God didn't end it on the negative, cause they're they they they're not in pain no more. Amen. They're not suffering anymore. They're not going through rejection anymore. They're in a new body. They're where we we're striving to be in time, in God's time. We don't want to be there before His time, of course. But life is full of paradoxes. You say, well, what is a paradox? Let me tell you what a paradox is in case you don't know what a paradox is. A paradox is a statement that seemingly contra is, it is seemingly contradictory or opposed to a common sense, and yet it is perhaps true. Mm -hmm. You say, well, that didn't make any sense. Let me give you an example of what a paradox is. Light is born out of darkness. Yes. See how they contradict each other? But when you go through darkness, light is born out of it. Life is full of what we call paradoxes. Here's another one. Life comes out of death. We just said from death to life. Failure is the womb of success. What kind of sense does that make? When you fail enough, you, you, you come to the end of your ropes. Your back is against the wall. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, in your weakness, God's strength is made perfect in you. Yes. So now that you've run out of ideas and you've run out of thoughts and everything else, now you go to God on a fast. You see God and you pray and you read the word and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will deposit a miracle idea that will be revolutionary in your life. So failure, out of failure comes success because God had you to come to grips with yourself. I cannot do it apart from God. Now you got your sense kicking in because now you know it's going to have to be the Holy Ghost. And when you depend upon God, he always comes through. Listen, true joy is birthed out of sorrow. We go through sorrow, but joy is birthed out of sorrow. Patience surfaces out of long suffering. You have patience. Sometimes my wife will let you know, man, I, I can be the most impatient person, but when I keep going through enough, I just learned to just say, okay, it's going to take two hours. Like this week, my the devil jumped in my truck along with, among my other stuff. And I was trying to tow the uh, generator over here from our tent. 
you know, and so forth. And I was trying to get it towed somewhere, and all of a sudden, my windows, uh, you know, we had mosquitoes out there where that thing was. All these mosquitoes came all over my face, was biting me everywhere. So then I told my window, roll up! I said to my wife, roll up the window, roll up the window! So she tried to roll the window. When I got in the truck, it was just inundated with mosquitoes. And I was back and flying, you know, trying to drive and doing this at the same time. So I rolled the windows down, all four of them, so they could be sucked out of there. And then I rolled them back up, and then the back, back rear window didn't even go up in my truck. I said, what? And the thing went over, I said, devil, you're a liar. Just all this other junk piled up on top of me. So I had to go and buy some duct tape and tape up the window, a new truck. Tape the window at Home Depot duct tape. Of course, it mixed in with the tenant windows, thank God. <laughs> Called everybody. They talked about it be two weeks before they could see it. I said, I don't want to be driving around the city with the window all duct taped up. And somebody could just take a little finger and stick it through there and steal everything out of the truck. So I called all the Ford dealerships, one, 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 one Ford dealership in Villa Rica said, well, I tell you what, we don't have appointments until three weeks out, but I tell you, if you come on Saturdays, we only got one technician, maybe he can see it. I said, what time you open? 7.30. I was there 6.45 <laughs> a.m. Not kidding. I'm not lying. This Saturday. Got there, and that little rinky-dink place didn't even have a sign up nowhere that said service center. I couldn't find the signs nowhere. So I was just waiting and waiting, and I came in the back, saw one of the uh, uh, employees drive up, and I said, hey, is this where I need to take my truck? It was like maybe 7.15, because they opened up at 7.30. About 7.15 then. He said, no, sir, it's not, and you're not in the right location. You're in the wrong spot. Now, he didn't have to go off and say all of that. I said, well, sir, I honestly didn't know. I said, I was here early. I'm just trying to get my truck looked at. We only have one technician, and he may not even get to your truck today. You see what I mean by pessimistic folks? So I said, well, sir, can you tell me where I go? He said, well, you missed it. There's 20 people in line ahead of you. I said, where are these 20 people? <laughs> right up front. You didn't see the sign? I said, no, I didn't see the sign. That's why I'm having to talk to you right now. <laughs> he says, well, there's 20 people up. So I turned the truck around, went on up there. I said, I ain't going to let the devil get, get, get the best of me because it looked like so far he tried his best that week. I, I ended up in, in the midst of all of that just waiting on God. Yeah. So I said, if I'm going to be here okay all day, no, it's okay. So I, I had that kind of attitude. So I parked the truck, come up there, instead of it being 20 people, it was like nine people, eight maybe. <laughs> so I was like the ninth one. And I said, I said, I came up here, and the lady said, I saw you when you came early. I said, I didn't see anybody because it was dark and I couldn't see nobody. They said, I, I said, they don't have enough sign. And she said, yeah, you're right. Everybody, yeah, they don't have a sign. You know, so, but they knew where to go. So I'm standing in line, and I just have in line, it's going to take the whole day to fix this thing almost. I told my wife, if it's too long, I'll probably call her so she can come home and pick me up. I said, but if not, then I just try to stay with the truck. So I wasn't impatient. I mean, all of that stuff I went through this week developed patience in me, y'all. I said, I'll do five, if it's gonna take four hours, five, six, whatever, I, I'm just, I, just, I just want my window fixed. And no more than 40 minutes, the, drive, the guy is driving my truck I said, oh, God, what happened? He can't fix the window? The window was already up. Mm. I said, what? I went, what? And look at God. He drove off in 40 minutes. Mm. I was the ninth person in line, and my truck was finished before any of them other trucks. Don't ask me how that happened. Baby. All I can say is, patience surfaces out of long suffering. Courage manifests out of fear. Certainty arises out of doubt. A pro evolves from an amateur. Think about it. Wholeness comes out of brokenness. Isn't that amazing? Amen. After you've broken and you submit your will, you give up, the Bible says when you're at your end, in other words, in your weakness, you've given up now. You've done everything you did in your weakness. God's strength is now made perfect in you. Yes. In your yes. weakness. Understand this, success is always connected to motion, not stagnation. Yeah. Success is always connected to motion, not stagnation. My wife and I went to a restaurant just a, yes, yesterday, oh, yeah. uh, Hudson's Barbecue, right up here on uh, Rose Avenue mm -hmm. in, in Douglasville. We were driving down Rose Avenue, and then there's a house that has this beautiful still lake right out in the front, a pond. Anybody ever been over there, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. It's a beautiful pond, it's just still, it's just still. Mm -hmm. 
and it's still waters. And I was, I was reminded of the scripture that says, you know, uh, uh, he needed me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. And when I saw those still waters, I was looking at those still waters. And I was just looking at the psalm in David. He needed me beside the still waters. The Holy Spirit said, no, the lesson is not for you to look at the still waters. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I said, I said, Daddy, I'm going to minister on that tomorrow. She, he said, the lesson is not the still waters. The lesson in this particular case is the stagnation, not the stillness of the waters. See, back in the day, in the old days, before mirrors were even created, people would look in the water, still waters, and see a reflection of themselves. Because think about it, they didn't have anything shiny enough to show their true uh, identity as to how they looked. So they would go by still waters and some women would comb their hair looking at the reflection of themselves from the still waters because it would be like a mirror reflection of their the true identity. And, 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 and it, just, it, it gives you the notation of peace, but then amid the still waters, listen, you got to understand this. You'll never find an ocean river or stream with still waters because they are moving entities always constantly moving going somewhere you're not going to be in an ocean where anybody ever saw still waters in the ocean man that's the time to worry i would think the world's about to come to end to an end if the ocean is vast and big and huge as the ocean is 75 or 72 percent of the entire earth is covered in water can you believe that so the ocean is never still, nor rivers or streams. These are moving entities. You'll only see still waters in ponds or in small lakes because they're not going anywhere. But the only problem with that is they breed tadpoles, which are small frogs that develop into frogs. They breed mosquitoes. They breed algae, bacteria, and numerous snakes as a result of them, and then they even develop pungent smells or odors that are sometimes unbearable depending on how much algae is in that particular body of water because of the stagnation. There is no movement. And it's not healthy if it's just there because what you see is what you get and that's all it's going to become. It's not moving so everything grows and builds up and it just becomes a disaster and you got to understand God doesn't want you to sit still doing nothing in your life. Many of you at an age right now, you cannot wait until you retire. But usually when people retire, they usually die. Not in every case. I've been retired for a while. I ain't planning on dying no time soon. My wife ain't planning on dying no time soon. No. But you know what? You got to stay busy. And the reason why is because even though that job that they hated, that nine to five, that gave them a sense of purpose. Yeah. It kept them moving. They were doing it for the paycheck just to stay alive to pay the, the notes, the house note, the rent, the car payments, and insurance, and all of that. But guess what? When you retire, now it's like, okay, I'm going to kick back. I'm just going to relax. I'm going to travel. You say that, but you don't do nothing but sit up all day long and watch television. <laughs> and people usually just eventually die because it's like their sense of purpose just comes to a screeching halt. Amen. Think about it. God himself is a moving entity. <laughs> Two thirds of God's name, G-O, is go. That's right. yeah. He's always on the move. God is always going. And anybody he deals with is always moving. They're going. Jesus never, ever, ever hired anyone that didn't have a job. All of his disciples, look them up. They were fishermen, tax collectors. They did all kinds of stuff. Physicians, they were doing something. They were busy. God didn't sit there to the one that's broke. Most people say, well, why don't we have these broke folks? Because that'd be a great blessing. The broke folks are broke for a reason. You're not to look down on a broke person. Christians are to open their bowels of compassion and help people, but we're to minister. Don't just give them money. You know, they say, if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a day. I mean, you know, you give him bread to fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. You teach him how to fish. So we're not just giving money out to homeless folk. We're trying to teach them how to fish. A lot of these people are just straight up lazy. Some of them have mental conditions 
to where they don't have any other way of getting money and it's a mental thing and they don't believe in themselves their esteem is so low and shattered that they don't have the gumption that it takes in order to go and do stuff because they have that pessimistic nature and they've been beat up over the years and this has become a lifestyle and the belief system for them so you have to take that person at, at where they are and, and show them where they need to be and build in them what God says that they are let them know this yeah. They don't know. They're at the end of their ropes. They're whipped. They have no breath in them. No second wind. No will to live. No will to fight. No will to stand up. They just give it in and succumb to their situation. Yes. And they're dying. Yes, yes, yes. Don't just sit there and die. Doing the same old, same old every single day of your life. Making promises. Doesn't this sound familiar? Year after year. Making declarations, resolutions year after year. Not fulfilling any of them. Only wishful thinking as the time clock of life keeps ticking, passing us by, growing older, still strapped in the loop and the rut of life, repeating the same old routine over and over and over again, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, not achieving satisfaction, fulfillment, jubilation. As we get older, packing on pounds in undesirable places, feeling more regretful, more disappointed, and most of all, more unfulfilled and unsatisfied. Right. Isn't that something? Yes. But the church is thrown in there on Sundays. We tip in every so often on a Sunday to go to church. Mm -hmm. Trying to get something out just to give us some kind of sense of something. And then go right back to the same routine. Now listen to this. If we can be honest, most of our lives consist of reading a few books, going on vacations when we can, being tied down to a job that we must have in order to survive financially, only to come home to relax and watch TV as we're being amused by what the old folks or the, some of the late bloomers or seasoned saints used to call the idiot box. <laughs> Looking at that thing called TV. A major chunk of every life, every day is spent on watching television, going to the movie theater, sitting before our computers, being amused yep. each and every day. Now, I'm preaching this, and the pastor even sits up there along with his wife and watches TV. <laughs> I'm not going to be a lying hypocrite up here. Oh, I don't do that sort of stuff. You see me just praying 24-7 every day. Oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, speaking in tongues. Just, you know, I have a life too, and I have to relax too. So I kick back, and I can't wait till I go to my favorite spot in that house, turn on that television, turn the AC on, kick back and relax. Amen. And just get amused <laughs> by this thing called a television. But then I know certain days, I, I give myself three days, three days a week to prepare my messages for Sunday. Three days a week, I have those three days locked down for preparation for a message from the Holy Ghost. That's why my wife always says, I've been before the Lord because I can't get a message or a word unless I'm in the presence of God. Been saved all these years. I know several scriptures. I don't know everything in the world there is to know. Believe me, I don't. But there's certain things I do know. But guess what? I, I know one thing. I better get a word from God. I don't want no canned message that I preached some years ago when the anointing of God is not on it and try to resurrect that thing when there's no anointing. I got to get a fresh word from God. Yes, yes. And it takes spending time before the presence of God in order to get that. But most of us, including us, are stuck on that idiot box. A major chunk out of every life, every day is spent on television, going to the movie theater, sitting before computers, being amused. Listen, if you look up the etymology, of the word amuse is going to shock you. The word amuse. Y'all want to know what the definition of the word amuse is? Yeah. When I say etymology, etymology is a term that means how that word got its name. It's called amuse for a reason. Mm -hmm. Certain words come from the Latin deriv derivative. Others come from, you know, uh, different other types of deriv deriv derivatives or whatever. And they put them together sometimes a word is a combination of two words and it's a word to us in English but it has two different meanings almost because you have a prefix fix and a suffix of the word but when you look up the word amuse it's a verb that means listen to this, it means to divert the attention to beguile charm or enchant as in a spell 
to win over, to captivate, to bewitch, to become spellbound, dazzled, hypnotized, mesmerized, seduced, trapped, enticed, lured, misled, tricked, duped, bamboozled, pulled the wool over eyes. From the old French word amuser, it means to fool or to tease, hoax, entrap, to cause, to muse, as distraction. It's to stare fixedly at. <laughs> Listen to this. To ponder, to dream, to wonder, to loiter, to waste time. Oh, this is going to really blow the socks off your feet. I hope y'all got some clean feet. Socks get ready to be blown off on this one. It means without thinking. Without thinking. We give our mind a, a rest. Not a rest. We tune it out. No creative thoughts can be stirred up. Nothing. We're watching that thing, the television. Amused as we're being deluded. As we're being charmed, seduced, spelled, tricked, bamboozled. We're sitting there and we're watching and we're watching, especially during COVID. I think the whole world was before the TV watching Hulu and Netflix and everything you can imagine, Disney Plus. We were looking at every, and if you didn't have a TV, oh God. Isn't it amazing that if you look at life now without television, it's almost like we don't even have a life. I bet you churches would be willing to go on a food fast for a couple of days <laughs> rather than the television and computer fast for a couple of days. Isn't that something? I guarantee you most people would go on a 24-hour fast, maybe even a 48-hour fast, as long as they can watch TV and stuff. But do you realize when you go on a fast, you're not even supposed to be watching television. If you do watch it, only Christian television, nothing else. You don't watch regular TV on a fast. It's a time of holy consecration before God. Yeah. And TV will take your spirit. You're not supposed to be watching that on a fast. Yeah. Not television. Uh-uh. Not movies. Not computers. None of that. Not on a fast. Mm -hmm. But most people don't want to go on fast because they got to give up the TV. Because it's got a hook tied into us so tight. Yeah. And believe it or not, listen. Listen to this. Now, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse, chapter 7, verse 3. Now four of the men who were lepers were at the entrance of the city's gate and said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? And this is what we're doing every day. Sitting there before the TV, movie theater, computer, twiddling our thumbs, not even thinking, being seduced, charmed, manipulated, bamboozled, Back in the day, before television, there was a sense of community. People would talk to one another. You go to third world countries right now. We took a missions trip right now where they have these ruined, these areas like in Pakistan and certain parts of Africa where they don't have TVs and stuff. Some of these villages, believe it or not, in this 21st century still don't even have power to these villages. In the 21st century, you go out there and set up a tent ministry, the whole village will be there. You know why? There ain't nothing else to do. That's right. There is no TV. We sit here, we've get, gotten so spoiled watching and being amused by the television. You got cable channels, 533 channels. You flip through all of them, click, 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 click. Man, there ain't nothing on TV today. <laughs> 533 channels to choose from. There ain't nothing to watch. Not no TV, ain't nothing, ain't nothing, ain't what about sport? Ain't nothing on there. All these channels, nothing's on there. Ain't nothing to watch. Five hundred and thirty-three channels. They don't have nothing to watch at all because we've been amused and so used. Now they got it where you can just take your, your channels, watch the stuff, the old stuff. Pull up what you want. Hulu, you can pull up your favorites. Sit there, watch it, watch it, watch it. And listen, you don't read books because there's TV that place replaced it now. Oh, yeah. Can't come to the family table to have good, decent discussions. Mom and dad used to sit there when we were growing up as kids. 
How's your day go today, huh, son? What you do in school today? Like, well, mama, I learned how to do my ABCs today. Well, I learned how to add my math and this, that, and other. Well, guess what, Johnny? You know, I'm going to reward you for that. And how? what about you, Susie? How do you do? Well, you know, we had gym today. I, a fight broke out in the gym, but that's okay. You know, everybody would talk. Well, mama, what did you do? Well, I went shopping today, did this today. You know, there was a sale over here. And family used to talk. Dad, what about you? Well, son, you know what? I'm working on a project on the job, but you know what? We're going to go on a vacation. Vacation? Where are we going, Daddy? Where are we going? Oh, we all going to go to Disney. Oh, great. It was family time. Amen. You mentioned family time. People will look at you cross-eyed in your house. What in the world was that? Everybody eats. You don't even come together. Some houses don't even have a table for people to gather together to eat at. Because there's no communication in the family. Neighborhoods. Grew up in neighborhoods. How many of y'all grew up in a neighborhood back in the day when we used to play tag and, you know, and all of that and hide and go see? Went up the hill, the hill was muddy. Stumped my big toe, made it bloody. Oh, listen. Are you here? Ready now? Folks whose hands are not going up because that went way over your head. We used to go out in the yard and everybody would skate. We'd be skating down the street, have skate parties. I grew up in London Townhouse. There would be a skate truck. He had hundreds of skates. Everybody in the neighborhood could rent the skates. We'd be skating all day. Community involvement. We could borrow sugar from somebody, eggs. Miss Johnson used to always come on our door asking for eggs. Mama just bought a cart of eggs extra, knowing she was going to come and beg for eggs. We had it there ready. And then Mama was low on sugar. She'd go to Miss Johnson's house. Miss Johnson didn't let us borrow the sugar. Yep. You go knock on your neighbor's door now. Your neighbor's door now. Kapow! <laughs> they shoot first, ask questions next in handcuffs. Who was that at my door? What was that about? Shoot first and ask questions next. No community involvement. We got a beautiful neighborhood that we live in. I didn't even know that many people lived over there until one day the, the, it rained so bad four or five years ago, the whole uh, uh, subdivision, the, the, the entrance, only one way in and one way out. The entrance in caved in and it was on the news. Our subdivision was on the news. We had hundreds of people. We got people that I know that went to my church at the time that lived in our community and we never saw these folks. Hundreds of them came out. Wow. I said, I thought this is a dead neighborhood. I mean, lots of young kids. Everybody came out. Because you couldn't get out of there. <laughs> Wasn't nothing to do. You couldn't get out of the place. You had to walk out. You couldn't drive out until they built it back up. Wow. But everybody fellowshiped. We had fun talking and meeting new people. And people we knew didn't even know they lived in our subdivision. They were there 2, 5, 10, 20 years. And we didn't even know this. Until everything came to a screeching halt because everybody's busy, 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 doing, 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 and watching TV. Yep. Being amused. Yep. And you want to be used by God, but how on planet Earth do you think you're going to even afford the time to be used by God? When all we want to do is relax and be amused. Back in those days, before TVs, people would at least escape from reality and read books. Yes. Amen. And they would put something in them to educate themselves, yes. Yes. to better themselves. You know what? The technological advanced media age that we now live in has literally stolen all of our time and attention. Yes. Notice this. I'm coming to a close. Graveyards are full of people that had tremendous potential. Right. Graveyards oh, yeah. full of people that had tremendous potential, world-changing inventions, life-saving techniques, earth-shattering designs and discoveries. Yet they took it to the grave with them because they sat down and just died and didn't allow the full potential of their lives to even kick in. God is the God of imagination and creativity, originality. He's the God of discovery. He's the God of ingenuity, innovation, enterprise, insight, intelligence, brilliance. God can give you something to live for. In fact, God said, I came that you might have life. Yes, yes. 
and that you might have it more abundantly. Not so you can sit there and be amused like the four lepers twiddling their thumbs wondering, where are we going to die? Man, let it just die some kind of way. Let it just die watching TV. If you're going to die, which we all are, let's go out shouting. Let's go out changing the world. Let's go out bringing as many souls to heaven with us. Let's go out with the bang. Let's go out leaving our mark, our print. Let it be that we were here. Amen? Amen. That's what we need to do. You need to ask yourself, now that I'm older in life and getting older, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with it? Has your life made a difference in society? Has it? Has your life, I'm talking to you, sir, you, ma'am, I'm talking to you. Has your life made a difference in society? Has your life been a visible mark in the earth? When you die, will anyone even miss you after you're gone? Have you helped change the life of even one single person? Because of your presence. Will there be a void in society after your absence? Think about these questions. What we need to do is take the baton of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and even all of your experiences, failures, successes. Gather some people up and pass the baton down to the next generation. That's called really leaving your mark. Listen, even if it means uh, by way of podcasts, video chat, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Zoom conference call. Listen, we're living in a brand new time and we all have to relate to new technology, new innovative ways of doing things that are different from the old ways. Listen, I want everybody to listen to this. I know that many of y'all are from the old school, but you got to understand, uh, the old school now has to adjust to the new school. Oh, yeah. Because we have no choices now. All of the old school paraphernalia has been done away with. Either we get trapped or deadlocked into a dead end, or we pick up the pieces and keep moving forward with new technology. Well, Pastor, this stuff is beyond me. I don't understand this. A lot of this stuff, I don't understand either. Grab me somebody young. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your grandkids know more about this than you can even shake a stick at. Talk about it. Grab a young person and say, hey, tell me how to do this. Yeah. Don't sit there twiddling your thumbs, waiting to die when your life can make a difference. There's knowledge, understanding, wisdom, experiences locked up in your bosom. Somebody needs. Amen. And you need to pass it down to that generation of somebody that needs that. Amen. Listen, hands on is always better than book knowledge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I learned how to install sand and refinish hardwood floors by hands on. You can learn the theories of book knowledge. They give you the theories and the reason why. They give you all the safeguards, but that stuff don't make sense until you get your hands dirty doing it. And when I learned from an actual contractor that showed me, I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words in a book. Just a picture is worth a thousand words. And I learned and I taught myself how to install sand and refinish hardwood floors. Made a good living at that thing for 27 years of our lives. We were making six figures. I mean, we had a, a cast of people working under me. I had over 40 employees in 26 years, or 27 years. Over 40 employees doing something I enjoyed doing at the time until that season was over. Then I went from that season into the car dealership season. Stayed another 18 years dealing with used cars. Being a car dealer, used car dealer. Made a lot of money in that. But now, we come to this notion, when I get old, it's time to kick back and relax. Listen, old folks are people that get older in Christ. Never retire. Look it up. They only refire. Oh, yeah. I say that again. They only refire. Yeah, yeah. So don't you dare sit there and just die and give up. You've got something to bring to the table, sir. Ma'am, you have something to bring to the table. Now listen, I've, I've given you the word of God from the sacred pulpit up here. 
You got the information. You can sit on it and go home and continue to be amused by the television consistently. It's not wrong with watching TV, but when we are trapped there for hours, six hours a day, eight hours a day, that is absolutely ridiculous. That's when you don't have a life. And all of what you could be doing, you could be learning and making money or making money work for you and then take your money and do something to uh, help somebody who's less fortunate. Go and do stuff with it. There are plenty of things. Listen, you, you need time, talent, treasure, thoughts, and not only that, but, you know, there are several other ways we can do it. Time means volunteer your time. Feed the homeless. Go to nursing homes, children's hospitals. Yeah. Help other ministries until we get ours up and running when we get our new, new building. I mean, our real new building. Uh, until we do, help others pass out food at soup lines. Yeah. Yeah. You know, volunteer and, and, and do that. Talent. You got talent. You got skills, ability, building skills, architecture skills. Go help Habitat for Atlanta. Sign up. Help out. Do something with your time. Don't sit there and just watch TV day in and day out. Do something. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel fulfilled. Go out and minister your Bible. Go with, witness to somebody. Minister to somebody. Lead them to Christ. Tell somebody something positive. Drop in a good word. There was a young man whose video went viral. There were kids knocking on doors in neighborhoods and running. And this one little kid... After he saw those other kids running, he came up to the door, and the lady had the green camera recording everything. She was on vacation looking at everything that was going on. He knocked on the door right after these guys that took off and running. He said, I just want to say to whoever lives here, whether it be a man or a woman, you matter. Your life matters. You can make a difference. Yes, you matter. Amen. And the lady said she saw that video and threw everything down and started crying. She said she needed to hear those words. And that little kid prophesied to the camera and gave hope. Just a little nugget changed that woman's life. And the video went viral. Five million views. Amen. Check it out. Google it. You'll see what I'm talking about. It'll come up. Just a word, a kind of word. That's all he offered. We already talked about a sermon some months back about random acts of kindness. You don't just do that after you heard a sermon and just do it for that week. That's a lifelong assignment. Amen. Change somebody's life. I was just reading on the app, the uh, Nextdoor app on my phone about a man who said that he had uh, gone to a particular place and had to pay $40 for something. Oh, no, no, he, 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 was, he, he had to go to the airport and he got on a certain airline and it cost $50 to check the bag in. So he was getting ready to give them a credit card, and they said, we don't take credit cards. We have to take cash. And he said, what? What do you mean you don't take credit cards? You got to take, I don't, know, I don't know if I got the thing backwards or what, but he couldn't do it because he didn't have it. So now he had to go and try to check, to check the bag into another flight, which means he would have missed his flight. And he said that he dropped his head and didn't know what to do. And a kind stranger behind him said, sir, don't worry about it. I got this. And he paid for that for the man. And the man hugged the stranger and said he forgot that people like that even existed in the world any longer. And that, that video or that story went viral about that man that gave him the $50 to check in his luggage. Because somebody made a difference. You all right here in this church can make a difference. Right here in RPM Church. Your life can make a difference. Your treasure, your money. You may say, I don't have the time. You may say, I don't have quite the talent either. But you may have the money. We had one lady here who was, who was blessed by our ministry. Last week, I told you, she just pulled my wife and I to the side and dropped a big check on us. And all of that money that she dropped on us that we would have been digging into our funds was paid off. Amen. On some of this work, we had to get down by the plumber and the uh, uh, structure engineer and the electrician. It was paid. And now we don't have to go into our personal church fund because her check took care of that. She dropped, her, listen, she dropped a little bit of her treasury on us. And not even a member of our church. And we got church folk that are members of our church that sit back, get all the benefits, and I'll just have to throw this out there, and some of y'all still don't even tithe at all. I just leave it at that. But you get all the benefits of everybody else. Everybody else has made a sacrifice. Everybody else is tired. God has blessed each one of us because of our sacrifices. 
And we, we get the best of both worlds and don't even pay any tithes to help out the church. I don't see how your conscience could even uh, fathom that. And if you want to talk about the word of God concerning that, I would gladly sit down and talk to you one-on-one -on -one and show you the scripture where tithing is real. Because there's no excuse to not tithe because you make money, you got to live in this world, but you don't tithe. I don't understand. But then we got our, our tongue, which is our voice to be heard, to tell people we could be an activist and platform. And then we got our thoughts, our knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Let me just say this. Many of y'all are thinking, well, I'm too old now. My days are past. They're behind me. But guess what? Your days are just starting. That's right. That's right. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. I just said it once, but I'm going to say it again. I'm coming to a close. <laughs> the plane is coming down. I close with this. I close with this. There's su successful entrepreneurs that started late in life. Mm -hmm. Sitting at the gates, like the three, the four lepers, twirling their thumbs, asking the question. Should we just sit here and die? Should we go there to the camp? If they capture us, we're going to die. We can sit here and die, get captured and die. Possibly they can let us go. We can have something to eat. Let's take a chance. Heck, we're going to die anyway. Yeah. Let's take a chance. They went on and took a chance Amen. just to find the camp empty. Mm -hmm. Everything was wide open. They took a chance. This, even in your older age, you got more wisdom than you had ever before. More knowledge, more understanding, more patience, more tolerance. Anybody ever heard of fashion designer Vera Wayne? Yes. Started late in life. Now she's a multi-millionaire. Martha Stewart. Started when she was 50 years old developing Martha Stewart Living Magazine, which brought her some multi million dollar status. Right. Lady went to jail, y'all. Mm -hmm. Lied about taxes. Went to jail, came out richer than she was before she went in. Because she had the knowledge up here. You can take the knowledge away from people that have the understanding, and they can, in a matter of time, be rich again because they know the cookie cutter process, how to work it because they know how to do it. You don't have to worry about your age. Listen, Ray Kroc was 52 years old when he stumbled across a small chain of hamburger restaurants or stands run by two brothers called the McDonald Brothers. He talked a lot of them and gave them a pitch and they gave him the restaurant. Now it's a big chain of restaurants called McDonald's. This man did that at 52 years old. The actor, this man got a cussing mouth like you wouldn't believe. We need to pray for his salvation. Samuel L. Jackson, <laughs> still acting at 73 years old. He makes anywhere between 10 to $20 million for a single starring role in a major production. Started when he was 42 years old, acting at the age of 42. Dr. Ed Lewis Cole, one of my heroes, started the Christian Men's Network when he was in his, get this, 60s. And that spawned another whole ministry. Coach McCarthy and the Promise Keepers ministry was birthed out of the Christian men's ministry. All these guys started in their 60s and were sitting there every day, twiddling our thumbs, waiting to die. Waiting to die. Who said that retirement was to kick back and relax? Maybe you were, you were waiting to retire so God can now give you your inspiration for life. You ever look at it like that? Now you can come to life. Yeah. life and now you've got a reason to live. Hallelujah. Colonel Hart Harlan Sanders, better known as Colonel Sanders, was 62 years old when he franchised Kentucky Fried Chicken in 1952. Listen to this, y'all. He sold the entire franchise business for $2 million. Guess what? Now there are over 18,800 locations of KFC as a network, and, and he has a net worth of over $4.5 billion. Wow. And he sold the company for, 200, uh, for $2 million. Anna Marie Robertson Moses. Y'all probably don't remember that name, but anybody ever heard of Grandma Moses? Oh, yeah. yeah, guess what? She didn't start her prolific painting career until she was 78 years old. At 78, she started painting. 
and sold one of her most prized paintings for $1.2 million. I need to tell my brother that. <laughs> Think about it. She didn't start till she was 78 years old. What is your excuse? We're sitting at the gate at whatever age you are in life right now, waiting to die. Why don't you make a difference and make your life count? You don't feel like you've done anything. It's never, ever too late. You still got breath in your body. You still got mobility to get around. You need to change the world even in your older age. You're never too late. The devil is a liar. Age is nothing literally but a number. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day by day. Let's stand, everybody.